Welcome to PPO Expert. My name is Tom and I'm presenting the Air Law course. This course is designed to give you an in-depth understanding on the theory required to pass the CAA theory exam for this particular topic. Despite this, own self-study, commitment and discipline will be required. The course is displayed in a form of slideshow, which I'll be talking through. Please feel free to pause the recording at any point, either to take a break or write down some notes. So firstly, we're going to look at why air law is important to us. Why do we need to study air law and why as pilots uh, we need to be aware of it. So it covers keeping safe uh, for us as pilots, rules of the air and also for the ground. Any political intervention and any laws that are in place. Standardization, so us and other pilots all doing the same, uh, same thing, same standard operating procedure uh, and we'll look with thinking alike and lastly accountability well a lot of these things are um, set out by law so if we do do something wrong deviate from what has been stated as a matter of law then we must be held accountable especially as uh, we have licenses uh, that we are accountable for any actions that could occur damage or harm to anyone else So how does this affect me? Okay, so much of air law, uh, whether it's when, within Britain or Europe, is legislation. That means it's uh, set out by law. So if we do, uh, we do deviate from the rules, we can be prosecuted. And the CAA, the Civil Aviation Authority, who is the governing body, will uh, will prosecute repeat offenders who do break these laws. And they will carry out ramp checks to check that we have the right documents with us, the correct licenses with us, all those kind of things. So we'll be in the aircraft, they'll come up to the aircraft and check that we have all of that just before we go flying. Okay, These will be random checks, and so that's why it's important to always be within our um, the, within the laws of flying and that we're not breaking anything. Okay. Currency, so flying skills do fade without practice, so as pilots we're subjected to a certain amount of flying to keep our uh, our license valid. If we don't meet these requirements, then we have to do refresher training with an instructor. So again, we could be caught up by these if we uh, ignore them, or if we to, if we decide to fly over this period and we get checked uh, by the authorities, then this obviously could be uh, we could be prosecutable for this. Okay. In every flight, there's a pilot in command who is responsible for the safety and the well-being of the passengers within the aircraft. Okay. And uh, if anything was to happen, they are are liable um, for any actions. Okay, uh, the operator has a very little li liability when private hiring. Okay, so it's even more important than to be on top of our, you know, our game. We need to be making sure that uh, we are complying with all the laws and regulations and not breaking anything. Okay, and lastly, enjoyment. So ultimately, if we're staying within the laws and legislations. That means we're enjoying our flying, that means we're not worrying about possibly breaking anything and it's going to make it more enjoyable to us. Okay, The last thing we want is to get into trouble, which will ultimately uh, not only cost us money or our license, but will take the enjoyment out of the flying itself. So we're going to have a look at uh, something called the Chicago Convention. So back in the 1940s, aviation was starting to boom and across a lot of the world, Aviation was getting, you know, more and more prominent. Okay, so they realised that they need to do something about it to make sure that all the countries that were starting to fly and uh, have aviation sort of industries that they're all complying with the same sort of ideas. Okay, so we had to go have a meeting to overcome all these barriers where people have different ideas, so we're all sort of operating on the same page. Okay. So that was the, uh, they had a meeting uh, in Chicago, 1944, this is known as the Chicago Invention, and the kind of things they talked about is what would happen if we overflew other countries, different navigation procedures, some rules of the air, and this was all discussed within this convention. So this convention, it's known as the, Con the Chicago Convention, but uh, it's also known as uh, the Convention of International Civil Aviation. Okay, and all these uh, different states came together 
to uh, comply and agree on different standard, standard practices. Okay, so on the 7th of December 1944, 52 individual different states or so countries signed this treaty to that we're going to operate our aviation sector in accordance with the rules and guidelines that we've set out. Okay, and by definition, its purpose was to understand uh, the future development of international civil aviation authority. So going forward into the future. Uh, and how that can greatly help uh, to create and preserve friendship and understanding among the nations and peoples of the world. Uh, yet its abuse can become a threat for general security. Okay, so like I said before, they're trying to come up with a standard practice and come up with agreements so every, every party is happy, um, rules of the air, so overflying different countries, navigation procedures, all those kind of things, so that all the countries were, were happy to participate and... Um, let other countries participate as well in standard practices. So the document itself uh, comprised of 96 separate articles um, which made the foundation of modern international aviation. So even nowadays these standard practices remain in place and it forms what other countries, uh, how we operate uh, our industry and the rules of the air and things like that. Okay. So the United Nations uh, established a special agency uh, called the International Civil Aviation Organization, also known as ICAO. Okay, and we're going to have a look at that on the next slide. So this ICAO, um, formed by the United Nations, uh, is a, uh, a sort of uh, a way of overseeing all the standards and the practices that have been implemented and the IK will regulate them, implement them and also monitor them as well. Okay. Now they come up with these standards and recommendations, they have two separate words so all authorities will look to ICAO to see how to operate and when they define a standard it's with the word shall which means that they will comply with something and there is no, um, they have no uh, reason not to do so. So if they want to be still be part of the treaty or I care, then they need to do these uh, standards that which are labelled or defined with the word shall. Okay. They also come up with recommended practices, uh, which means they don't have to legally be done, but with the word should. So it's a highly recommended practice, and the ICA would like to see this member state implement them. However, it's not imperative that they do so. Okay, so all these these words shall and should uh, you can see have a very specific meaning, and that will define how countries operate. Every country will be slightly different in their in their way of operating. So, uh, depending on how they interpret the word shall and should, will differ between how they um, operate their aircraft or have different laws and legislations. So ICAO set the framework for all national authorities, so different countries have their own national aviation authority, but they all revert back to ICAO, which is that standard practices okay, all around the world. And all the members must incorporate the standards into a law, so uh, it's all these standards will be implemented by um, law itself. Okay, Recommended practices can be deviated uh, with, that, with uh, notification. Okay, So if there is a reason that we don't want to, uh, or a member state doesn't want to comply with the recommended practice, um, they, have, they can do so, but they must have a notification from ICAO and a reason why to do so. Okay, so we're going to look at something called freedoms of the air. And during the Chicago Convention, Part of what they um, discussed was the flying of other countries or to and from other countries, right? And this is known as freedoms of the air. So what each country can do, where they can fly to and from without any limitations. Okay, this was discussed within the Chicago Convention. Um, they're not actually rights, uh, but they're kind of grants that uh, all countries are allowed to do. Okay, and there's five different freedoms which we're going to have a look at next. Okay, and individual freedoms and there's the different parameters which are involved. Okay, so the first freedom was a right for an aircraft to fly from state A to overfly state B without landing. Okay, so the example I'll give for this one, if an aircraft was flying from the UK to Spain, it would more than likely have to fly over France. Um, so with A being the UK and uh, B being France, 
there was no um, the the state A could legally fly over or had the freedom to fly over the state B without uh, any issues whatsoever. Okay. The second freedom is the right for an aircraft to from state A, so I'll use the example of the UK again, to land in state B for technical reasons only. Okay, so if uh, we were taking off from the UK going to Spain and we had some technical issue, we were able to land in state B without prior permission for any kind of uh, technical issue, emergency or something like that. The third freedom is the right of an aircraft from st state A to fly paying passengers from state A to state B. Okay. So we have the, the right to fly from one country to another, okay, without any uh, kind of penalties or anything like that. The fourth freedom is basically the reverse of the third. So the rights of an aircraft to fly from state, uh, an aircraft from state A. So if it's, for instance, a UK registered aircraft to fly from B uh, back to state A. So that reverse of um, the third freedom. So we have the free free right to fly to and from different countries um, without any penalties or uh, conflict. The fifth freedom is the right of an aircraft to uh, from state A, so imagine state A is the UK again, to take paying passengers from state B to state C. Okay, so if even if we're a UK registered aircraft, we do have the freedom from fl to fly from one country to another, which isn't the UK, okay, and that's in that fifth freedom. We do have the um, the legislation to do so. Okay, now we're going to look at something called cabotage. So, cabotage is the transport of paying passengers by state A domestically within state B. Okay, so an example of this, and this legally can't happen, but if we were a UK airline and we flew to America, okay, let's say we flew to New York. Um, and then instead of flying back to the UK again, we flew on from New York to Los Angeles. Okay, this would be known as cabotage, cabotage because it's a domestic flight. Okay, it's not specified within the, within the five freedoms. So if we want to carry this out, we must have special permission by that particular member state to do so. Okay, most places don't allow it, however, because uh, they've got their own economy and their own airlines that can do such surface. So the example of this is the uh, Fly USA um, America policy, which doesn't allow cabotage, so we wouldn't be able to do that. So now we're going to have a look at the UK structure. Um, and of, of our governing bodies. So all of our governing bodies start off at the top with ICAO, that international organization, okay, and that covers all the member states worldwide. Okay, then it comes down to a European scale for the European Aviation Safety Agency, and then um, with the uh, in the UK we have the Civil Aviation Authority, which reports to the. Uh, European Aviation Agency. At the time of recording, um, we are still part of the EASA. However, with uh, political changes going on, with such as Brexit, uh, it's likely that uh, the UK Civil Aviation Authority will no longer be part of EASA, and we will report straight to ICAO. Okay, we'll be our own separate governing body. On the other side of the Civil Aviation Authority, we're also uh, governed by the Department of Transport within the UK. Okay, so we have regulations from EASA and ICAO, and we must comply with them. And we also have some regulations, uh, UK specific, from the Department of Transport, who also give us guidelines um, uh, if and when they need to. Okay, so we need to follow their guidelines, recommendations, and uh, the, the uh, rules of the air they set out. And uh, if we do so, then we can ensure that we're operating in the safe and most, the safest manner possible. Okay, so in the UK, all structure and regulations is decided by EASA. Okay, so it's above the UK Civil Aviation Authority. EASA set out these guidelines, and that's part of the rule that uh, we are part of EASA. So if we're part of EASA, uh, we must follow their regulations and legislations. Okay, the UK is uh, the UKCAA is an 